hi welcome back to spooky saturdays today we're going to be talking about the yandere killer but before i get too deep into yuka takaoka and phoenix luna i want to explain to you guys like what a yandere is because if you guys don't watch anime or maybe you're just more of a slice of life person it's just not your genre you might not be very well versed with the concept a yandere is in essence a character archetype and it's exemplified by a female who is super in love with somebody and they're willing to go to the ends of the earth for that person. But don't get confused and think that that means that whoever they're obsessed with, whatever their object of desire is, has control over them. In fact, it's usually the opposite. It wouldn't be the case where the girl's in love with this guy and he tells her to do A, B, C, and D and she just does it. Sometimes that happens, but really, the yandere is the one who is the more domineering party in the relationship, if the relationship even exists. The yandere will do any and everything for their person, but that's always through the lens of what they perceive to be best for them. The person who they're actually obsessed with, oftentimes their opinions don't factor in even when their opinions go directly against what the yandere is interested in doing. An example, a common trope is like, a yandere will be in love with a guy. That guy will have a female friend or a coworker, and the yandere will violently hate that person and often try and attack them or undermine them or destroy them in any way possible. The guy that they're in love with might be like, hey, that's my friend, or even like, that's my sister, or that's my mom. <laughs> Please don't hurt her that would make me upset. I thought that you love me and you don't want to make me upset. And that might like mildly sway the Andre, but for the most part, they're going to eliminate any and all threats that they perceive as standing between them and their end goal, which is like to get this person. And getting that person doesn't necessarily mean like that person loves them back so much as it is just like fully possessing that person just being so overwhelming that like you're inescapable and they have to eventually love you because you're just so insanely devoted no one else would go to these lengths this archetype is like most made famous by future diary which is actually a good show i like that show because of this case especially a lot of people are hearing about the yandere character archetype for the first time and they're like why would anybody like that but it's the same as like any other fantasy character archetype to be honest, especially in like a, a YA novel, for example, like Edward Cullen, like watching Bella while she sleeps. Everyone makes fun of that because they're like, that's creepy stalker behavior. And then girls are like, we don't literally want someone to do that. It's just supposed to be an over the top example of like how devoted this person is to you. And because it's not real, it's a safe space for things like that to happen. In reality, of course, that would be like frightening, let alone like when you factor in like the concept that this guy's like, someone who eats people. Yandere is basically the same thing. It's just a fantasy that a woman would be so obsessed with you, so drawn to you, just can't think of anything but you, that they might do like the craziest ever, but it ultimately comes down to the fact that like, they love you so much. That's appealing to a lot of guys, especially a lot of guys who might be like antisocial and might not be the type to shoot their shot or approach their crush. The idea of a woman being like, whoa, I suddenly saw him and then I was obsessed with him for the rest of my life and I centered my whole life around him, can be very appealing, is what I'm saying. Now let's get into our main character, our guy. Phoenix Luna, which by the way, he didn't start going by that name until after this incident, but I'm gonna just call him that the whole time for the sake of simplicity. Phoenix Luna, his family fell apart when he was young. He had a lot of siblings, but they all ended up being scattered through the foster care system and they lost sight of one another, in essence. he he wasn't able to remain in contact with all of them after this happened. So he's young, he's trying to break out of the cycle of poverty basically. And there's this thing in Japan called hosting. A lot of Americans like from a Western lens might compare it more to like escorting, which is different than like prostituting yourself. Escorting is like when you go on dates with people so they can be seen out with you and they look cool. And oftentimes like it can go hand in hand with prostitution, but they're not the same thing. Hosting is like sort of like that, but just it's, it's way more normalized. Like it's just way more common. People just kind of think of it as like a fun, cute, go out with your girls or your guys and do it. In fact, it's like, very very popular among married women so that's how like I don't want to make it sound more taboo than it is that's how normalized that it is it's not considered culturally weird what hosts do on a daily basis is they go to the club 
and they drink with like women but it's not about just like being hot and being around them and showing interest it's really more about the conversation component it's really more about forming a connection it's really more about like combating loneliness if anything to be honest the way that i understand that it is set up which like foreigners generally can't go to things like this not because of like xenophobia but because the communication is truly the most important aspect and so there's like a belief that if you can't be communicating with your host effectively then there's no point like they're not just there to stand next to you and be pretty like you're supposed to have a connection with this person so they do have clubs that are for foreigners but all the hosts speak english so i'm just saying like your average like club your average host club foreigners are generally not allowed into so they have to have special ones where they speak the language so that you can have this connection i'm just trying to make sure that people know it's not just a physical thing it's really more about like forming a bond so you go in and the host will rotate so the, your first time that you go in you'll go through like every single host and there's like a, a tier system for like host popularity so you'll start out with like the more popular ones the ones that everyone thinks are hot and charismatic and stuff and you'll cycle through everybody and basically they'll try and figure out like who you connect best with and so then when you come back the next time for your first hour because it works on an hourly cycle like payment wise you would be with the person that you connected with the most and it's also not that you're sitting for an hour straight with that person they're going to you they're like table bouncing throughout the hour and like whenever they're not there there's somebody else there talking to you but like they would be your main person so this is really appealing to phoenix luna because every host is provided with free housing and so it solves his problem of like, I need to get a job. And I, now that I'm out of the foster care system, I need a roof over my head. It was two birds, one stone. And then after he started working at the host club, he found that he really, actually really grew to love his coworkers, his fellow hosts. And he said that it actually did feel like a family for him. Like he, he had his found family, which is wonderful. Right off the bat, he was doing really well, actually. People felt that he was cute, they felt like he was charismatic, and he was making a lot of friends. So he was ranked decently, but most people who are like top five hosts have been there for like years and they've carved out like a long list of clients because like you get ranked that way based on like if you're booked and busy and like how much money you're making. So if you're new, you're not gonna be booked out like months in advance or something like that. Here is where we meet our yandere. Yuka Takaoka was also a host actually. So she was doing the exact same job, uh, not at the same place because like obviously where Phoenix Luna worked, it was all male hosts. And then where she worked, it was all female hosts. But she would, there was a lot of cross pollination where like male hosts would go to female host clubs and vice versa. And it was like, you know, sort of like an industry community in a way. And it, it's also nice cause it's like, you know, the host couldn't really have boyfriends or girlfriends. I mean, you could, but it was really heavily discouraged because if your clients see you out with somebody who you're clearly actually dating, cause like you're kissing and, and like clearly a couple in public, you know, they might feel a sense of betrayal. Cause again, like you're forming this emotional connection with your clients, like that's the whole point. So it's discouraged. And if you are gonna have a relationship with somebody, it has to be incredibly discreet. Beyond that, it is really common in this industry for people to be prostituting themselves, but they're not allowed to do it on the grounds of the host clubs. And the host clubs, they don't really do anything about this because ultimately it, you know, it works out for them. Their employees are subsidizing their income nicely and obviously their clients are heavily incentivized to keep coming back if they end up going to a love hotel at the end of this whole thing. So. Yuka and Phoenix, they started hitting it off, which like is his job. She knows that because that's also her job. It's not that she's hanging out in his host club for free. She, like everybody else, paid to go in. But she was doing really well at her host club. She was actually the manager of her host club. She climbed the ranks really, really swiftly. People felt that she was beautiful and really charismatic. And so it seemed obvious to him that like she gets it. This is just like what we do. She was also prostituting herself outside of work to her clients pretty regularly. And so she was as invested in this industry as you could possibly be, is all I'm trying to say. 
She starts going and she's giving Phoenix a lot of tips because obviously she would know. She's been killing it in this industry for years now, so she's just happy to help. And he's happy to have her help. He's really grateful. So she starts booking him out and she's like, yeah, I'll give you tips to help you with your clients. And also like, if I keep booking you, you know, you'll climb in the ranks. It then gets to a point where she actually really likes him and so she starts booking for dates outside the club also so they start going out to dinner and hanging out but she's still paying for all of this it's not that like they met through this one way and then they ended up just being friends she was still an actual literal client who had to pay and book his time just like anybody else and he felt that she knew that but then she starts to become increasingly possessive and they actually start fighting a lot because he's confused. He's like, we do the same thing. Like, I don't yell like you for going to your job, but we work the same job. Like, you should get it more than anybody, you know? Even my typical clients, like, they might make a couple jealous comments, but, like, they still understand at the end of the day, you know, I'm a host. I, I'm not some random person that you just met in a club. I, you met me at my job where I'm hosting. And she starts going through his phone and she actually starts following him around. And so she's exhibiting, you know, an escalation in behavior. She starts getting mad that he's seeing any other female clients. And she actually had an incident with him where one of her friends claimed to have seen him outside of a love motel with a female client. So she flies off the handle. She's like, you were sleeping with this other girl. I thought you'd love me, da, da, da. And then he's like, oh my gosh, no. Like we just went into the love motel and cuddled. Like it wasn't like that. You know, sometimes people ask for that. Like you should get that. And so they always ended up working through their problems. But he was getting a little, you know, frustrated, I guess you could say with but the fact that she just seemed to be like not really getting it anymore, like not really understanding what they were to each other. He also didn't realize how heavily she was going through his phone. So one night she books him and she's like, hey, can you come over, help me clean my apartment and then we'll just like hang out and relax. That's like a common thing, by the way, like people when they book hosts outside of like the club, it'll be like sometimes like normal boyfriendy things like that where it's like, help me clean my house. Let's go grocery shopping, you know, stuff like that. And that's common in the other direction too, like with the female hosts as well. So he's like, oh yeah, sure, absolutely. But he had other clients earlier in the day and ultimately his time with his client that he had slotted before her ended up really, really running over. So she's just fuming in her apartment in essence up until the time that he gets there. He gets there and they clean up a little bit but she feels like he's being really cold and distant. He's just like no like I'm sorry like I know like time ran over but I'm just like really tired I've just had a long day at work like you get it I'm exhausted and she's thinking to herself like no he's being cold and distant because you know we had just recently got in it got into it again over his other clients and he feels like I'm gonna freak out right now over his other clients so he basically asks like hey now that we're done cleaning, can I just like take a bath really quick and then we'll cuddle and go to bed? And she's like, yeah, sure. So he gets in the bath and he wasn't lying. Like he really was very tired because he fell asleep in the tub. So he suddenly like wakes up when his like chin starts dipping down the water a little bit, does a little, <laughs> oh my God. He's like, whoa, that was like so dangerous. I could have drowned in there. Like I've got to get out of the tub. I clearly need to sleep. So he got up and he just kind of like crawled into her bed and he fell back asleep. Then suddenly he felt an, a sharp pain in his stomach and it caused him to wake up. And that's when he saw Yuka sitting on him and she had just plunged a knife into his stomach, specifically his liver actually. And he said that he was just so shocked that he couldn't even fully feel the pain. So he shoves her off of him immediately and he's bigger than her he's stronger than her he's in good shape and so he has a knife sticking out of his body but he's going head up with her he's like i gotta get out of here so he fights her off he runs out into the hall nobody's out there 
and he makes his way to the elevator and he miraculously gets into the elevator closes the doors without her getting in but he's got blood all over his body he's got blood all over his hands so he's slipping trying to hit these buttons he's kind of like losing his clarity his, his vision's going in and out he gets down to the lobby and he's like oh i just need to get out into the lobby i just need the doorman to see me and then someone will help me and the elevator doors open and he just passes out he just absolutely passes out unfortunately for him she had taken the stairs and she made it down there what yuka did next would make this case truly infamous she saw him collapsed on the ground bleeding out she knew he wasn't dead yet but he was dying and so she sat down next to him in his blood called a friend wasn't talking about the murder or anything in particular was just sitting there on her flip phone talking to her friend calmly pulled out a cigarette and started smoking at this point another woman in the building had come down to the lobby she sees this scene of this woman just calmly sitting there smoking clearly it's not like a mutual domestic dispute because she's fine she's talking on the phone she's not even talking about anything particularly important and then there's just this dead guy next to her with a knife sticking out of his body covered in blood so she snaps a picture real quick just incredulous to capture evidence and she calls the authorities right away but she doesn't directly intervene and over the course of the next 15 minutes or so a lot of other people would also see the same scene and choose not to intervene and they said that they just felt intimidated by the situation because she was so calm that they didn't know what this woman was capable of i mean clearly she's capable of probably having killed this guy because who else has done it um so you know if i get too close what's she gonna do to me she's obviously unstable the authorities show up and they arrest her and she doesn't really make a particularly big deal out of this she just kind of gets in the back of the cruiser and is sitting there and is taken away by the authorities they start collecting evidence and that's when they find a key piece of evidence which was her diary in her diary she's writing things about this situation she's detailing like her emotional spiral out of control her obsessive thoughts about phoenix luna and she's saying things like i just want to kill him so we can be together because really she felt that that was the only way to get these other women away from him so that he could be only hers and she told the authorities that she was planning on it being a murder suicide and she was really just waiting for him to die before she was going to kill herself though we don't see any evidence of her actually taking any steps towards trying to kill herself to be honest with you she was really just sitting there smoking a cigarette talking to her friend but she said that she was working up to it meanwhile obviously things are not looking good for phoenix and he's rushed to the hospital because he was stabbed directly in the liver you know he's ex he's just full of blood he's experiencing organ failure things are going very dark very quickly but they somehow miraculously save his life all of his friends from the host club come and visit him and they really truly were like a family like he they, it wasn't like a situation where your boss is like we're like a family and then mistreats you all the time like they were really there for him the doctors then tell him like okay we've got good news and bad news like you've obviously survived that's insane that's like a miracle that's great but because of where she stabbed you you know you're never going to be able to drink again given his job which he actually did want to go back to after all of this because it was his only sense of stability that was a really big problem because that's where hosts make a lot of their money it's not just getting the clients to buy drinks for themselves but like you know a whole part of it is like you're supposed to be having this experience with someone so it's common for the clients to like double up buy drinks for themselves and the host but he can't drink anymore so that huge part of his paycheck he would never be able to tap into that ever again but then his co-workers were like dude don't worry about it anytime a client orders you any drinks we'll drink them on your behalf they're not going wasted we're not gonna we're not gonna keep those funds like it's all still gonna go to you like you we don't want you to have to worry about anything you've been traumatized enough this is when he renames himself phoenix luna because he felt that 
in that moment, he was a phoenix rising out of the ashes and he was gonna be born again, he was gonna start over and it was gonna be fine. Obviously, things aren't looking great for Yuka in the eyes of the law. This is a pretty cut and dry case and she's not trying to deny it. Uh, however, something incredibly unexpected happened. The photo that that woman in the lobby had taken, it went incredibly viral. And it didn't go viral because of the shock of like, wow, this is horrible, I hope that man's okay. It went viral because anime fans were like, whoa, she's like a real life yandere. I didn't know you could do that. And suddenly people were obsessing over her. Mind you, she was a host, so she had the looks, you know, she had this charismatic history that people could attest to who knew her or had been her clients. And then now she had this murderous mystique around her. And this isn't obviously like, it's not just anime fans that do things like this. I'm not trying to make anime fans look bad. I'm an anime fan, but you know, this is a common problem with true crime across the board. Whenever somebody who has a lot of pr pretty privilege commits a heinous act, people are way more inclined to dismiss it. And suddenly it becomes like hot and kind of cool of them. And the fact that there was this pre-existing trope of like really beautiful but insane women who do things like this with this exact motive. And this guy's also really commercially attractive. People were just like, it's straight out of a K-drama. Like this is straight out of an anime. Like I can't believe it. This is straight out of a webtoon. Like, oh my God. And the connection was just for too many people, I guess, undeniable. It's one thing to make that connection and be like, whoa, this is crazy. This would make a great anime or something. It's a little cold, obviously, but <clears throat> you know, people make media off of murders all the time. I'm doing that right now. You know, it's not inherently problematic as long as you're being respectful to all, all those who are involved in their families and stuff. But the problem lies in the fact that then people started bombarding social media being like, does anybody have her contact information? Does anyone know if she's single? I'd let her do that to me. That guy should be so lucky. Guys, he's lucky he's not dead. Okay, like the cognitive dissonance is a little extreme. And when it was time for sentencing, you know, Phoenix Luna, he had to make an impact statement as most victims do. He had to attest to the trauma that he had experienced. And he did attest to it. He, you know, he explained that he likely has PTSD from this. He wakes up with nightmares, worried that she's gonna be sitting on him again like that. You know, that's all to be expected. But he also, and I don't know if this is because he himself had a rough childhood and like he also felt that he'd been misunderstood many times in his life. He, he also just demonstrated a lot of grace in his impact statement. And he asked the judge to, in essence, be kind to her. He was like, please don't be too harsh with your punishment of her. You know, like obviously she needs to be punished, but ultimately I'm fine. And actually my career is better than ever because like this was insane publicity. I mean, I wish it wasn't something that had happened, but if I'm being objective about it, like be beyond the trauma symptoms, you know, my life is, is fine, if not, you know, even better than it was before. So please take that into account. I personally, like, I want her to be punished, but I don't want you to like throw the book at her. So she ended up being sentenced to just three years in prison. And this was back in 2018. So Yuka's out of jail now, actually. And the first thing that she did was post her Instagram. And uh, she posted a series of links to all of her other social medias. And you would think that this would have been met with a lot of controversy. Actually, you know, her stance showed out. They've been waiting for this moment for, for years now. And uh, she got a lot of followers and she got a lot of internet clout basically immediately. So it seems that she's using her like I'm back post to redirect people away from her existing Instagram to new social media platforms. Her current Instagram is sitting at like 80,000 followers. I don't know if this is because this post brought attention to it or if they were already there. I did go through the links. I'm not gonna tell you guys her Instagram because I obviously, I don't wanna, um, you know, promote her. And I actually did have to dig a, a little bit to even find it, which I think is good. But, um, you know, she also has a YouTube channel. She hasn't uploaded anything on it and she has 
less than uh, 800 subscribers on there so it seems that you know people aren't exactly moving through to the links which I think is good and she is also on TikTok, though she hasn't posted anything on there either. So it seems like she may be gearing up to get out into the social media scene because I'm not sure that she's going to be able to go back to her hosting job. I really am not sure what the social stigma attached to a case like this is going to be because, I mean, ultimately it didn't end up being a murder so much as it was a vicious assault with murderous intent. But in Japan, in general, the murder rate's actually really low. So when something like this happens, it's truly very jarring for like the national community. So I would, I would assume that she's likely gonna be a social pariah to a certain extent. Usually when there's a murder case, they try and keep everybody as anonymous as possible, but with a case that's viral like this, uh, I mean, it obviously, it, it wasn't possible. Overall takeaways of this case is this is just another example of people glamorizing murderers if they think that they're cute. I really don't know why like it goes to such a level that it does whenever that happens. Like it, it always transcends beyond just like, wow, it's unfortunate that someone so handsome or beautiful has done something so ugly. I could understand that, you know, because if you're just stating it as like an objective fact or something to each their own, I suppose. But for some reason, it just always seems to extend way beyond that and turn into this like almost worship, worshiping behavior, which is is gross. And I do wonder like what the psychology behind that. I have a few like speculations, obviously, like I'm not a psychologist, so I'm, you know, just talking out of thin air. But part of me wonders if it's like a survival instinct when people see something like this to align themselves with someone like that. Like when a vulnerable kid sees a beautiful bully, you know, and that bully happens to not be bullying them right now. So they align themselves with the bully right away and they become like their right hand man and like suck up to them nonstop. I wonder if it's that kind of survival mentality of like, if we're in the state of nature and there's somebody who's like incredibly aggressive and predatory, it's better to befriend that person than have them turn that aggression on you. Like maybe it's some sort of fawn response that it, it just translates very weird in like modern times. I really don't know. I, I That's me giving it like the benefit of the doubt. Like if I had to give my best angle on it, that's what I think might be going on, but I could be totally off base. And like, it goes without saying, worst case scenario is people who think that kind of behavior is cool and edgy and they're like, I wish I could be brave enough to be a terrible person, you know, but I feel like people have talked about that angle a lot. That's the end of our story. So thank you for coming to the second Spooky Saturday. If you haven't seen the first one, definitely check that out too. And I'm doing Mukbang Monday this week. I may have a surprise guest. I'm not sure. It depends on our schedules, but it would be sick. If I'm alone, just know that like, I'm gonna have that same guest at a different time, but I hope that you guys tune in anyway, cause it's either gonna be me mukbanging by myself or me with uh, some nice friends. So I hope you guys like it. And of course for the mukbangs, I'm gonna be going over like history content and my normal content style. YouTube's not gonna be like a fully spooky space. That's just for Saturdays, and that's what the spooky Saturday wig is here to indicate. If you came from TikTok, thank you so much for crossing over. A lot of people don't, and uh, I, I really seriously appreciate it. I really do, because I get demoralized on YouTube a little bit, because it's like just so much more work, and then way less people watch it, and then I get a little sad, but you know it's worth it. I'm building, I'm building to something. Um, and if you don't follow me on TikTok, you found me on here first, sick, uh, you should check out my TikTok, and everybody should check out my Instagram. If you wanna see what I do in my personal life, I still repost all my content on there too. It's sort of like a catch-all. Like if I have a new YouTube video, I'll be promoting it on Instagram. I repost my TikToks on Instagram Reels and stuff, but I also post more of my personal life in videos and images on there than I do on any of my other platforms. So if you want like a sort of inside look into what I'm doing, that would be the place to go. All right, bye.